Um, we're going to be moving um, on to um, session three, which is a presentation by Debbie Potts from Surrey County Council. Um, and the subject topic is unexplained injuries, neglect and acts of omission. So thank you for joining us today, Debbie, and um, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Sarah. I will just share my slides. Hopefully everybody can see, see my slides. So as Sarah said, my name is Debbie Potts and I'm one of the safeguarding advisors um, in Surrey County Council. My role is as a safeguarding advisor is with Surrey's provider services. So they're services for people with learning disabilities and reablement. Um, but at the moment, I'm helping out in the adult safeguarding hub. Um, just before we start, I just wanted to echo what Teresa and what Sarah have just said about, you know, making sure that you look after yourselves. And if there is anything as I go through my session that um, triggers you and you need to take a break, please do so and make sure that you look after yourselves. So I thought that it might be helpful to take us back um, to the CARE Act as our starting point. Um, reminding us of what it says about adult safeguarding and getting us to think about when we need to raise safeguarding concerns. So the CARE Act says in Section 42, an inquiry by a local authority. So this section applies where a local authority has reasonable cause to suspect that an adult in its area, whether or not ordinary resident there, has needs for care and support, whether or not the authority is meeting any of those needs, is experiencing or is at risk of abuse or neglect, and as a result of those care and support needs, is unable to protect himself or herself against the abuse or neglect or risk of it. So if you have reasonable cause to suspect that a person with care and support needs is experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect, you need to raise that adult safeguarding concern to the adult safeguarding hub. If all three of those points are met, then the local authority must trigger a Section 42 inquiry. And that decision is for the local authority to make, and the statutory guidance is quite clear around that. So Section 2, Part 2 of Section 42, says that the local authority must make or cause to be made whatever inquiries it thinks is necessary to enable it to decide whether any action should be taken in the adult's case, whether or not under this part or otherwise, and if so, what and by whom. So the local authority leads on the inquiry and will complete the Section 42 inquiry if it has been triggered. The person or their representative and other people involved in supporting that person will be asked to contribute to that inquiry. If a crime has been committed, then the police would also be asked to make a contribution to that inquiry. The local authority will analyse all the information that has been given to them um, to be able to make professional judgments about the action that needs to be taken. And just sort of thinking back to what Emily was saying just before lunch, I hadn't seen before um, that Wannacott's discrepancy matrix. And, you know, looking at that briefly, as we did earlier, I think that's a great tool um, and for people to use and maybe would help with some of that professional analysis. In doing, making those professional judgments, the most important part is to make sure that the outcomes of the person are being met. So that's what the person wants to happen 
as a result of the abuse or neglect or risk of abuse or neglect that has happened to them. So for this session, I'm going to be focusing on neglect and acts of omission um, and thought it would be helpful if we start by looking at some of the numbers um, of safeguarding concerns that are raised in Surrey. So this graph gives you an overview, um, and I'm not going to talk too much specifically about the specific numbers of um, concerns that are raised, but just to show you an overview. Um, the blue columns on this graph show you all of the safeguarding concerns that have been raised in Surrey. Um, the end column is the total number of concerns. The others breaks it down by quarter. The ones in orange are concerns that have been received with neglect and acts of omission. So when we look at these, in 2023, sorry, 2022, 2023, there were 17,617 safeguarding concerns received in Surrey, an enormous number. And of those, 9,514 reported a risk type of neglect and acts of omission. So looking at those numbers, neglect and acts of omission that category alone represents 54% of the total concerns that are received in Surrey. In this graph, hopefully you can see this, it is a bit smaller. Um, this graph shows that those total concerns received, including neglect and acts of omission, um, it looks at them specifically for falls, medication errors or missing medication and missed home care visits. Obviously, there will be other things that are categorised as neglect and acts of omission, but within um, Surrey's recording system, particularly makes notes of these things um, and records numbers for neglect and acts of omission in relation to falls, medication errors and missed home care visits. So in 2022-2023, there were 1,230 safeguarding concerns reported involving falls, for example. Um, so you can see across on this graph that the orange um, bar is falls, the grey one is medication or missing air, um, medication, um, and the yellowy colour is missed home care visits. I think there needs to be a bit of caution around some of these figures because sometimes um, I understand that people will record all three um, for one concern um, and you know that might not always be the case. So there, there will be duplications as um, with looking at the figures. There's no breakdown of figures kept for unexplained injuries but I just thought it would give you a flavour um, of the issues that are being received. Then this looks at Section 42 inquiries completed with neglect and acts of omission. Um, there were 1,456 inquiries completed that involved medication errors or missing medication, for example. Again, you know, there's a bit of caution around the figures um, because people are recording, you know, all three types um, within when they are um, recording on the system. So be aware of that when you're looking at some of the figures. So I'm sure that you're all aware of this, but I wanted to emphasise um, when you need to raise an adult safeguarding concern to the adult safeguarding hub. The adult safeguarding hub received lots of inappropriate safeguarding concerns and that can create an enormous amount of additional unnecessary work and that can put um, significant delays 
um, in responding to things that have been referred that are appropriate and needed to be referred as adult safeguarding concerns. So you need to refer an adult safeguarding concern when you have reasonable cause to suspect the person you are referring has care and support needs and is experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect. So that third point that I showed you on my original slide, point C, which is around the person being unable to protect themselves because of their care and support needs, is for the local authority to determine. Um, and so just when you're raising the safeguarding concerns, you need to look at those first two points. And if I always think of it as sort of having ticks next to them, and if you've got two ticks, then you need to be raising that adult safeguarding concern. If all three have got ticks next to them, then that means that a Section 42 inquiry, as I've already said, should be triggered by the local authority. So neglect and acts of omission are described in the care and support statutory guidance as including ignoring medical, emotional or physical care needs, failure to provide access to appropriate health, care and support or education services, the withholding of the necessities of life, such as medication, adequate nutrition and heating. And the social care Institute of Excellence on um, their web page around safeguarding adults, the types and indicators of abuse, show some additional things to look at in terms of neglect and acts of omission. The failure to provide or allow access to food, shelter, clothing, heating, stimulation and activity, personal or medical care. Providing care in a way that the person dislikes. Failure to administer medication as prescribed. Refusal of access to visitors. Not taking account of an individual's cultural, religious or ethnic needs. Not taking account of educational, social and recreational needs. Ignoring or isolating the person. Preventing the person from making their own decisions. Preventing access to glasses, hearing aids, dentures, etc. Failure to ensure privacy and dignity. So you can see how things such as missed visits, by a domiciliary care provider, a medication error, someone having um, an unwitnessed fall, um, having an unexplained injury would fall into the category of neglect and acts of omission. So this is what um, Social Care Institute of Excellence says about some of the signs and indicators of physical abuse, which I think helps us to describe um, unexplained injuries. So unexplained injuries can be described as no explanation for injuries or inconsistency with the account of what has happened. You know, injuries are inconsistent with the person's lifestyle. So when we're talking about unexplained injuries, we're talking of quite obviously about anything that you don't know what has happened. It might be about bruises, skin tears, other significant injuries. Um, some of those um, might be, you know, we could say that they might be due to physical abuse, but equally um, there might be neglect and acts of omission that has led to that happening. Some of you might have attended the board's last conference, um, which was quite a few years ago now. Um, and at that conference, there was a safeguarding adults review was discussed that was from West Sussex. And that was in relation to Matthew and Gary. Um, both of those men had sustained serious unexplained injuries, which were fractured femurs. 
and that safeguarding adults review um, talked about how um, the cause of those unexplained injuries that people have been quite biased in their thinking and hadn't explored how those unexplained injuries may have been caused. In preparation for today, I've been looking at some other safeguarding adults reviews where um, unexplained injuries um, were being discussed. One of them that stood out for me and links very much to what Emily was saying earlier was a safeguarding adults review that was from East Sussex. And this describes where um, a district nurse was professionally curious um, when she went to see um, the person who is referred to as Adult B. And she noticed that um, Adult B was wearing very thick makeup. She wiped some of that makeup off and exposed that the lady had significant cuts and bruises on her face. Um, these, she asked the person, she asked her son, who was her primary carer, um, and those bruises and cuts were unexplained um, by both of them. So by being professionally curious, the abuse and neglect um, was, was raised um, for that lady. If we think about missed home care visits, um, I thought it would be helpful just to look at a definition. And if you are providing care to people in their own home um, and the, through the services commissioned by Surrey, um, there is a specification. And this definition is within that specification, which comes from October 2021. This says, that a missed call is where an individual has not received a visit, where one is scheduled and does not receive a visit before the next scheduled visit and has not been contacted to rearrange the time of that visit. So a missed call meeting this definition would be considered as neglect or acts of omission on the part of the provider and therefore a, a safeguarding concern would need to be raised because there is that reasonable cause to suspect that, um, that neglect may have occurred within that situation. Just looking at medication errors, which I know there's always lots of debate around um, in terms of adult safeguarding, um, where I work within service delivery. Within our adult safeguarding procedures, we've set out what would constitute um, a safeguarding concern um, within the procedures to make it quite clear to staff. So what we have said is that medication errors should be raised if concerns for one of the following situations has occurred. So the medication has been given to the wrong person, they've been given the wrong medicine, it's been given by the wrong route. So for example, eye drops put in the ears. They've been given the wrong dose or that dose has been given at the wrong time. The policy then goes on to say that if it's noted through the usual monitoring processes that there's a recording error, such as a missed signature or wrong code on the MAR chart, and gap monitoring processes show that the above criteria have not been met and appropriate action is taken, then it does not really need to be reported as a safeguarding concern as there is not a clear or present risk to the person. So when we're looking at that gap monitoring and auditing, that is immediately after where there has been um, medication given and so the errors can be picked up immediately and rectified and then there doesn't need to be an adult safeguarding concern raised because that risk has been, um, has been corrected. 
So it might be something that, you know, if you haven't got something in your own safeguarding adults procedures, that you might want to include something to clarify for staff when you might want um, them, when they need to raise um, an adult safeguarding concern in relation to medication errors, but being very clear of how it fits with that criteria that is set out within the CARE Act. So just looking at the Safeguarding Adults Board's policies and procedures, in 24.1, it states that the expectation of the Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board is that a safeguarding concern should be referred to Surrey County Council on those occasions when it is reasonable cause, when there is reasonable cause to suspect that a person with care and support needs has been at risk of abuse or neglect due to a care visit being missed, medication being missed, a medication error occurring or a fall occurring. I'm sure that lots of you are already aware of this guide that is on the Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board's website. Um, this is around making good referrals of adult safeguarding concerns. And this puts into practice the Local Government Association's document, which is called Understanding What Constitutes a Safeguarding Concern and How to Support Effective Outcomes. So it makes that guidance, it puts that guidance into practice for how we use that locally in Surrey. The guidance describes how some of the areas that I've already mentioned to you, such as missed calls, medication errors, um, or missed medications, falls, can all be challenges to services in determining whether or not a safeguarding concern needs to be raised. Um, the guide and discusses how services can often confuse um, that and think about the scale of harm in making that decision on whether to raise an adult safeguarding concern. The, the scale of harm is not relevant um, when you're looking at whether or not to raise that adult safeguarding concern. You, I keep saying it, but we need to come back to those points in the CARE Act um, and look at those to inform us on when to raise that adult safeguarding concern. So in relation to unexplained injuries, it might seem simple, but we always need to start by asking the person what has happened. Um, it's not rocket science, but in my experience, so often people don't actually ask the person how they got that injury in the first place. If the person is able to tell us what has happened and there's nothing to indicate that abuse or neglect has occurred, you don't need to raise that adult safeguarding concern. And you know, sorry if I'm stating the obvious, but quite often um, within the Adult Safeguarding Hub, we'll see, the, you know, things that we know exactly what has happened. There is no abuse or neglect um, that has occurred, but people will still raise an adult safeguarding concern. Is there a reasonable explanation for what might have happened? If yes, and there's nothing to indicate that abuse or neglect has occurred, again, you don't need to raise that adult safeguarding concern. So you need to look at what that reasonable explanation might be. Um, you know, just because someone is on blood thinners might not be that reasonable explanation. Um, it might put them, it, well, it obviously puts them at higher risk of um, getting bruises, for example, but 
there must be something else that has caused them to bruise. And if you think, you know, if you're aware that, you know, if we're thinking about an older person in a care home and you know that they walk very close to the walls as they're walking down the corridors um, and they hit their hand or they hit their arm on the wall as they're walking along, you've got a reasonable explanation for how that bruise might have occurred. You know what has happened. There is nothing that gives you an indication that abuse or neglect may have occurred. And so there's no reason for raising that adult safeguarding concern. But if you've got an unexplained injury and you have got that reasonable explanation, please, please make sure that you record that decision so that if you're asked about it, if you're asked why you haven't raised an adult safeguarding concern, you're quite clear um, and you can defend that decision to the social worker, to the Care Quality Commission, whoever comes in and asks you and challenges you around your decision. You need to look back at that Care Act definition, you know, and be able to evidence why there is no reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect has occurred. What is that reasonable explanation? Obviously, if you haven't got a reasonable explanation for how that abuse or neglect, might, or how that injury might have occurred, then you're not able to rule out abuse or neglect and you need to raise an adult safeguarding concern. Okay, so I just want to give um, an example. We'll just um, look at Mrs. Rodriguez. She's an 89-year-old lady who is taking blood thinners and has paper-thin skin. She lives with her daughter and has support from a domiciliary care agency. She has limited mobility and a standing aid is used for transfers. She's got bruises on both her shins, both at the same height, She's living with dementia and she's not able to say what has happened. Karen is hopefully going to launch a poll um, for us now. And I want you to look at, you know, is there reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect has occurred? So if you could just take a moment to complete the poll. So if you look in the chat, you'll be able to see the responses to the poll. We'll just wait a couple of minutes. Number of responses is still going up, so we'll just hang on.
Okay, I think those responses are slowing down and might have come to a full stop. So we've got 48% of people have said yes, but there is reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect has occurred. 32% have said no, and 19% have said that they don't know. So let's have a look and think about Mrs. Rodriguez. So we've got that she's taken blood thinners and she's got paper thin skin, which puts her at higher risk of um, bruising. We've got bruises at the same height on both of her shins and we know that a standing aid um, is used. That standing aid has got um, pads on, on it that um, support her shins um, when she is standing. So we've got a reasonable, I would say we've got a reasonable explanation for how those bruises might have been caused. We know we so the bruising matches where those um, pads are. She's been using, I haven't included, but she's been using the standing aid for some time. But a few days before, she needed to be transferred significantly more frequently, which um, because of her incontinence, which is thought to have been the likely reason why she has sustained some bruising and with you know taking those blood thinners and having the paper thin skin. So there's no reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect was occurring for her. Let's move on to think about the falls. You find someone on the floor. Again, Often doesn't happen that people don't think to ask that person what has happened. You know, if they're able to tell you and there's nothing to indicate that abuse or neglect has occurred, you don't need to raise an adult safeguarding concern. You know, if they tell you that they were just reaching forward to pick up their glasses that they dropped and they toppled forward, you know that there's been an accident, you know what has happened. You know, if they're not able to tell you and they're at high risk of falls, are those falls prevention measures in place? You know, did they have sensor mats in place, for example? Did those alert staff? So if all the falls prevention measures are in place and there's nothing to indicate that anyone else was present, then you don't need to raise an adult safeguarding concern. Again, in the same way that I discussed, that you need to make sure that you record your decision so that you can defend it if you're challenged. Again, you need to raise why you're not raising an adult safeguarding concern in relation to the fall, if that is your decision. But if fall prevention measures, for example, aren't in place, then you would need to raise an adult safeguarding concern because potentially you have neglect by the provider. So I'm just going to go through with you some factors that make it more likely that a fall needs to be reported as a safeguarding concern. And these factors are in that guide that I mentioned earlier on making good um, adult safeguarding referrals in Surrey. So where an adult using a service sustains a physical injury due to a fall and there is a concern that a risk assessment was not in place or was not followed. The key factor is that the person may have experienced neglect or organisational abuse. Where an adult in a service has su sustained an injury other than perhaps a very minor injury which is unexplained. 
where an adult in a service has sustained an injury and appropriate medical attention was not sought. Where an adult has repeated falls of unexplained nature and where advice has not been obtained. Where there has been an incident following on from a pattern of high numbers of falls for adults living in one service. So all of those factors would make it more likely that you would raise an adult safeguarding concern. Oh, sorry, I've missed one. And where there's an adult that has repeated unexplained injuries. So just moving on to look at another example. Mr. Patel is a 78 year old Muslim man who has recently been admitted, admitted to a care home. He has advanced Alzheimer's disease. He's been identified as being at high risk of falls and has a floor bed and a crash mat. He's found by staff in the early hours of the morning, kneeling next to the crash mat. So again, Karen's going to launch a poll for us. And I just want you to think about, is there reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect is occurring? So we'll just wait a couple of minutes while, while those responses are coming in. OK, I think it's slowing down now, so um, you can see the answers as before in the chat. So we've got 13% have said yes, 81% have said no, and 4% have said don't know. And that is great to see that, that um, so many felt that it was no, um, as I would agree with you that there is no reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect was occurring. Um, the family in the situation um, is based on a real case. The family had informed the care home that he would, you know, he was a Muslim man um, and he would get up early to pray. And so that is what it appeared that he was doing. Um, and there was a pattern, there became a pattern of in the early hours of the morning are finding him kneeling next to his crash mat. And so there was no reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect was occurring. Those risk management measures were in place um, and you know he was he was getting up to pray. Let's look at another situation. So Mrs. Brown, an 86 year old lady who has a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, as a result of this, she's got some cognitive decline. She's been identified by the care home as being high risk of falls and falls prevention measures have been put in place. That includes a bed sensor to alert staff when she's getting up. She's found on the floor next to her bed by a member of staff who's completing routine night checks. So I'll just ask Karen to launch another poll. And is there reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect is occurring. So 
we'll just wait while those poll results are coming in. Okay, I think we've just about got there. The results are flowing down. Oh no, a few more coming through. So for Mrs. Brown, we've got that 64% said yes, 29% said no, and 6% said don't know. So with Mrs. Brown, we've got there that she has a fall sensor or a bed sensor in place to alert staff when she's getting up. But we've got that she was found next to her bed by a member of staff who was completing night routine night checks. So there's nothing to show us that staff were alerted when she got up by the bed sensor. So we don't know how long she's been on the floor. The bed sensor hasn't gone off, so risk management measures weren't being followed, and so there is reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect was occurring, and so an adult safeguarding concern would need to be raised in relation to Mrs Brown. Thank you all for your participation in the poll. That's that's the last poll that I have within the presentation. So I just wanted to very quickly just mention um, about pressure sores um, and the guidance that is on the Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board website within the, um, the procedures is the pressure sore um, protocol um, and you know looking at that interface between pressure ulcers and a safeguarding inquiry. Pressure sores might be as a result of um, neglect or acts of omission, um, but equally they might not be. There can be a range of factors that, um, and health colleagues will be much more familiar with those factors um, than me. I know that sometimes people will say, well, it was graded as a grade three pressure sore. Um, and so we needed to raise an adult safeguarding concern. There is nothing within the policies and procedures around that. Um, this guide looks at a scoring system. And if the tool scores 15 or above, you need to raise an adult safeguarding concern. It doesn't matter how a pressure sore is graded, some pressure sores that um, are quite minor might be as a result of um, abuse or neglect occurring, but equally some pressure sores that are quite major might not be as a result of abuse or neglect occurring. So there is no blanket policy um, in relation to referring um, pressure sores. You need to make sure you look at that Care Act um, criteria and, you know, if you have reasonable cause to suspect that abuse or neglect might be occurring, then you would raise that adult safeguarding concern. But I would really suggest that you take a look at this guidance um, before raising that adult safeguarding concern. So just... Um, We've talked, I've talked a lot about raising adult safeguarding concerns. I'm sure you all know where um, to raise an adult safeguarding concern, but just as a reminder, you'd raise it to um, the adult safeguarding hub 
Um, preferred option is through the online form um, and all safeguarding concerns should be raised to the adult safeguarding hub, even if the person has the, um, a named social worker um, or referral should go through to the adult safeguarding hub. And that brings me to a close. I hope I'm not too quick there, Sarah, for you, but I've built in some time in case there are any questions. I've just included at the end some useful links um, for you on report, you know, the links to where to find the guidance, um, where to find that guidance that I mentioned from the Local Government Association. Thank you for all those, those claps. That's appreciated. Um, and if anyone has any questions. So we've just had a question come in there, Debbie. Uh, do you feedback to refer as the outcome for learning purposes? Yeah, the outcome should be referred uh, back. Um, I know that that isn't always consistently fed back, but it should be. And, you know, please contact um, Adult Social Care to get that, that feedback if you're not hearing back. Again, can't see any other questions. But, oh, back, just in okay. the Q&A. Um, oh, am I looking in the wrong place? So again, do you get feedback regarding concerns? So the answer is yes. Can I come in there, please, actually? Debbie, I think um, sometimes referrers may not get feedback, obviously, depending on what the concern they're raising yeah. is. Yeah. So I think... Yeah. A blanket yes isn't quite there. For those of you um, on the call, there is um, some slides that um, were done. A webinar was generated. However, unfortunately, the video has gone into the IT ether. But the previous match manager did a presentation which was really valuable for agencies because it may not be appropriate for you as a referrer to get feedback. So I think that needs to be um, there as well. You would get you would get feedback though, Sarah, to know that your concern has been received, um, and you know you are likely to get feedback on where your concern has been directed to, um, even if you can't be given the detail around what is actually being done. So yes, I apologise for saying yes, it's a blanket yes. I should have been more more. Uh, I should have clarified that more. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say is the board's pressure ulcer document is currently being viewed and updated, um, but we still want agencies to be using that currently, but it is being looked at by a small task and finish group. Got another question from Justin who's asked, uh, what should be done in the case of self-neglect? OK, so self-neglect, um, if you if you're referring a case of self-neglect using the online um, form, um, then you will see that that directs um, people to the contact centre, sorry, County Council's contact centre or inf information and advice um, and for an assessment of that individual's needs. There is more within the Safeguarding Adults Board policy and procedure on how Surrey looks at self-neglect, but the first um, point wouldn't be to undertake a section 42 inquiry it would be to look at um, an assessment of that individual's needs thanks debbie uh dilip yes the powerpoint slides will be available on our website uh, after the conference um so you will get a copy of those uh jill concern on asking persons how sustained injuries even on establishing have cognitive capacity is there not a risk of intimidation and threat? The victim will not give true replies for fear of recrimination. Uh, professional curiosity would be useful here. I think where I'm saying that you need to ask the person, it is, it is literally where 
you find something is just saying, oh, I've noticed that you've got, I don't know, whatever that might be. Um, how, how did that happen? It's not asking any more than that. Um, but yes, obviously, you need to look at that situation and wouldn't want to do anything that put the person at additional risk. Um, and so decisions need to be made on a person by person um, basis. Uh, Annika has asked, uh, she said that we've found that different localities have different thresholds for what they consider to be a safeguarding inquiry. Uh, this causes confusion when supporting people in services across different areas and where they are commissioned out of area. Why the discrepancy? Mm, uh, mm, why the discrepancy? I think um, there is lots of work um, being done. Um, to um, to try to get that more consistent um, response. Um, but yes, I would recognise that there are discrepancies, but, you know, that duty um, is quite clear within the CARE Act on when to trigger um, that Section 42 inquiry. There's lots of guidance within the Safeguarding Adults Board website, um, sorry, not website, within the procedures, um, <clears throat> and adult social care has lots of guidance around undertaking um, the Section 42 inquiries. Um, you know, obviously, if there are lots of discrepancies, they need to be looked at and to try and get a more consistent approach. And all I can say, um, I don't know that this helps, but that's sort of work in progress to get that more consistent um, approach across Surrey. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, Haley's asked, do you prefer us to use the online form rather than our own OP17 form for referrals? Hey, I don't know what an OP17 form is, um, but yes, the preferred way for um, the Adult Safeguarding Hub would be the online form because it asks all of those questions that um, enables them to make those initial decisions about what needs to happen. Um, but yeah, sorry, I don't know what your OP17 form is. So it might be that that has all of those questions on it, um, but you know, it would be much better because there will be um, some automation at some point that will help the um, Adult Safeguarding Hub with processing all of those referrals. So yes, the online form is the preferred way. Thanks, Debbie. Um, on the back of Annika's comment, uh, Chatel has asked, do you have any examples of the discrepancy you may have come across? Or Chatel, is that, I'm guessing you're, you're coming to Annika on that one. Annika's just replied to you, so. I, I would suggest that you go back to whoever has made that decision um, and ask them why they have or they haven't triggered that section 42 so that you've got that information. Um, when commissioners are putting pressure, sorry, I'm reading what's written in the comments as well as I, uh, while I'm talking, um, so that you've got that information um, when pressure, pressure is being put on you, you know why that decision was made. And Laura's asked a question, um, if you disagree with the outcome that, is, that says it's not a concern, can you discuss it? I'm assuming that's with Adult Social Care Hub. And Debbie, I don't know if you can answer that or not. Yes, yes, you can discuss. Are there any other questions for Debbie? There's a question in the chat. Um, why cannot be a national safeguarding? I'm not sure that's from the um, Green Gables, not sure exactly what you're talking about. There is one Care Act for the country. 
we know there are differences between different local authorities. What's important is that you are following Surrey Board's policy and procedures um, for anyone who is in Surrey. I can't see any other questions. Um, so again, thank you, Debbie. That was a oh, really uh, useful session. And I think it's uh, important to remind ourselves of the statutory guidance and also just be aware of the, the policies in place. So um, I think we recognise that there are avoidable safeguarding concerns and it's important for us to kind of address those um, and, and within our own organisation. So, so thank you. Um,